Why do we buy the things we buy? Why do we do the things we do? Why do we choose the things we choose? And are our choices always rational? Or are they driven, ultimately, by emotional triggers? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you a question. What do you desire? Now you're thinking, who's this creepy guy? Let me explain. <laughs> Who here has watched the series Lucifer? Nice. Well, for those of you who didn't, let me explain. Lucifer is, in fact, a devil. Well, he's a pretty handsome devil. And he's been ruling hell for thousands of years. And you know what? It got boring. So he decided to go on an extended holiday. And he picked the second best place in the world, after Mabea, obviously. <laughs> Los Angeles, the city of fallen angels. And he's living quite the playboy life. You know, topless vintage car, owns a nightclub, plays the piano, drinks industrial quantities of whiskey. And let's not mention his rather prolific sex life. But above all, he has three superpowers that I am jealous of. One, he never gets a hangover. Two, he's pretty much bulletproof. And three, he can make anyone reveal their innermost wishes. All he needs to do is put on that creepy smile and in his most seductive voice ask, what do you desire? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to compare myself to Lucifer at all. At least not yet. Although we do have a couple of interests in common. But I'm sadly lacking in the superpowers department. And yet, most people would probably agree that I am the closest thing you'll ever get to meeting the devil. Because I, ladies and gentlemen, am a Mabea estate agent. Now, you think I'm exaggerating. Do you know the reputation we have out there? And not just in Marbella, worldwide, we're one of the least trusted professions in the world. What do they call us? Sharks. We'll sell our grandmother for a deal. We'll do anything to close that deal. And if you've watched Selling Sunsets, well, you'd think that all we do all day is gossip and uh, drink champagne at open houses, right? Oh, hang on, that is what I do all day. <laughs> but jokes aside, it actually raises an important question. Why do we exist? No, I'm serious. Why do we exist? Why do I exist? I mean, what's the point? Can't two sensible, consenting adults get together? I want to buy, you want to sell, we shake hands and live happily ever after. Well, apparently it's not so easy. Maybe we're not that sensible after all. Maybe we're not even adults. Somebody once said that estate agents are matchmakers. And then they're wedding planners too. There's a lot of truth in that. And in fact, real estate has a lot in common with dating. And of course, these days it's all online, right? And you can go on the internet and you can scroll through properties all day long. You can't swipe left or right on them yet. I'm sure it's just a matter of time, but can you imagine Tinder for real estate? <laughs> can you imagine the amount of horrible first viewings you'd have to go on? <laughs> when the property looks nothing like the picture. <laughs> or it looks very nice on the outside and then you realize it's just the facade has been recently renovated. <laughs> Maybe a few illegal extensions. It's a special Mabea problem. And then you discover there are a few towels missing on the roof. <laughs> no, it wouldn't work. We need the matchmakers. And then we need the wedding planners too. And that's where it gets really interesting. Because you would not believe how irrational each and every one of you become when there's big money involved. Today I read an article just this morning about a realtor in London. He had a heart attack. He deals with you know, very high-end clients, and he had a heart attack three years ago. He is 39. Well, I'm not worried. I'm 22, so I'm still fine. But <laughs> It gets very stressful. People are remarkably difficult. But guess what? 
We always learn the most from adversity, don't we? We learn the most from difficult situations, and we learn especially from difficult people. I am so grateful to all the difficult clients I ever had, and I've had a lot. I would like to thank them all from the bottom of my heart. And there is one I want to thank especially, and I'm going to tell you the story of this, my most annoying client. First of all, he was looking for a rental. That's a bad start. I don't like rentals. <laughs> and he was doing the rounds around the agencies of Puerto Banus, and what he was looking for was quite simple, really. He wanted something small but spacious, you know. And he was one of those annoying people who comes... <laughs> exactly. He's one of those annoying people who comes with a list, you know, a long checklist of, of requirements. He clearly knew very well what he was looking for. And he would walk into the agency and rattle off his list. S modern, spacious renovated, nice views, one bedroom is enough. He seemed to be recently single. He was looking for, you know, just a small apartment. And he would rattle down his list, and he would leave it on the desk of the estate agents, and then he would leave. And as he left, at the door, he would turn around, like Inspector Columbo. Do you remember Inspector Columbo in his trench coat? He would ask 500 questions. And then at the end of it, he would say goodbye, he would leave, and just as he at the door, he'd say, just one more thing. <laughs> he did exactly the same. Just one more thing. A fireplace. Oh, it's not important, not important. <laughs> you know, it'd just, just be nice to have a fireplace, you know, but don't worry about it. It would be nice. Next morning, he was getting emails from all the agents, property after property, and he was opening them and said, oh, Okay, this looks nice. Spacious, modern, renovated, oh, nice views. Yeah, okay, hmm, oh, no fireplace. Hmm. All right, next. <laughs> Ooh, nice, beautiful views, big terrace. Nice bedroom, hmm. Uh, no fireplace, all right. Oh dear, this looks terrible. My God, this hasn't been renovating since the 70s. Oh, the furniture's terrible. No, never in a million years. <gasps> it's got a fireplace. Guess which one he went for. <laughs> Guess who that idiot was. <laughs> but you know, I'm very grateful that I found this fireplace. And yes, it's real, it existed. The rest of the apartment was pretty bad, but the fireplace was really nice. This was not my light bulb moment. This was my fireplace moment. And this fire began to burn brighter and brighter as the years went on because I discovered this extraordinary phenomenon again and again. It made me realize that that one thing that makes us go, yeah, baby, that one thing that makes us go, yes, I want this, that one thing that even might make us go, yes, I do, is almost always an emotional trigger. Ladies and gentlemen, virtually every decision you ever take is driven by an emotional trigger. Every decision is ultimately driven by some kind of desire. A few years later, I did one of my most important sales. It was a big luxury villa. And it was, I think it was the second or third property we viewed. And as we walked in, I could see that the client liked it, but, you know, he was still he was walking around, he was looking. He was walking through the living room, he got onto the terrace, and then he saw the tree. It was a huge, you know, one of those cork oak trees we have up in, in the hills. He saw the tree, and he turned around to me and said, This is it. I'm going to buy this house. I love that tree. I thought, okay, I clearly gave him enough wine over lunch. <laughs> he was serious. Now, obviously, he didn't go for the house just because of the tree. It ticked most of the boxes on his list, but not all. In fact, I did not expect him to go for that house. I expected him to go for another one. But the tree was his trigger. And later on, after the matchmaking phase, once we were preparing the wedding, and it was quite a wedding, it got delayed and delayed, problem after problem, and we could have lost that sale many times. Every time we hit a problem, he kept telling me, 
I just want to sit under that tree with my kids. I am dreaming of sitting under that tree and looking out to the sunset. That tree saved us. Now, that trigger is not always obvious. In fact, most of the time it's not obvious, not even to ourselves. It's not top of our list. It's probably not even on our list. And there's a reason for that. Because deep down, even if we are aware of it, we're often ashamed of it. I know I was. I knew I wanted a fireplace, but I wasn't ready to admit it. I mean, who needs a fireplace in my bed? It's warm most of the time. Why is that important? There are ten other things that are far more important. Why the fireplace? That's why I said it like that, you know, in Columbo style. Oh, just one more thing. It's not important, not important. Desire is very powerful. And desire usually trumps need. Okay. We obviously live in a fairly privileged part of the world. If you are starving, then yes, maybe your priorities are a little bit different. But in our world, desire almost always trumps need. And if you're doubting, let me ask you a quick question. And I'd like to have a show of hands. Who wants to be a millionaire? Pretty much everybody, right? Who doesn't want to be a millionaire? Okay, let me ask you a different question. Who needs to be a millionaire? Okay, still a few people. Well, it is Marbella, I understand. But <laughs> you, clear, you clearly have expensive tastes. You are my ideal clients. Come and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but the reality is, none of you need to be a millionaire. Nobody needs. But we all want to, right? Because it would be nice, just like a fireplace. Desire is very, very powerful. I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room and people who founded startups. I have a question for you. Why? Why are you doing this to yourself? Are you crazy? Why don't you? Do you know what you're getting yourself into? Why are you not getting, a, why are you not getting yourself a stable job? Preferably with the government. You can never get fired. You get paid for the rest of your life. Best of all, you never even need to work. But no, you spurn the stable job. You don't want the security. You chase your dream. You chase that desire. And don't tell me it's rational, because in the beginning, you're not going to make more money. Very unlikely. Maybe in the future, you will. But you chase it because you want to be independent, because you want to realize your dream, because you dream of having your name up there one day alongside Elon Musk. Is that rational? No. But thank God you're doing it. Desire trumps need. You may think that this only applies in this luxury market we're living in, right? It's all about jacuzzis and swimming pools and fireplaces. What about people who only really care about money? What about investors? Surely they're rational, right? Well, when I asked you who wants to be a millionaire and who needs to be a millionaire, we don't really need to. Do we really need to make a big profit? But money is maybe the most powerful emotional trigger of all. I mean, imagine the things we do for money. Money that in most cases we don't need. N not the knowledge of this, the realization of this is very powerful. Because once we realize that we are actually driven by these emotional triggers, we can change our approach to business. We can change our approach to life. We can change especially our communication. And it's all about communication, isn't it? It's in real estate, definitely. I remember when I started, I was asking all those stupid questions that everybody asked, like, how many bedrooms do you need? How many square meters? Who knows how many square meters they need? And then com agents complain that buyers are liars. Have you heard that phrase? I hate it. I think it's one of the worst things you can say. Buyers are liars. We might as well say agents are idiots. It is equally untrue. It is equally incorrect. But if we're going to say one, why not the other? No. We just don't know. And many of us don't know how to uncover the thing that really makes you tick. And once we do, once we learn how to communicate, we no longer have to play all those games or ask those stupid questions, but we can actually grow together 
as partners. I want to leave you with one lesson that I learned here in the run-up of this TEDx. You know, we had some rehearsal sessions, and we were not all born this brilliant. You know, we had to learn and rehearse. And we were giving each other feedback. And during one of the sessions, one of my fellow musketeers was giving me some feedback. And he said, well, your speech is about persuasion. And I said, what? Yes, well, it's persuasion, sales, you know, it's the same thing. That's when I had another one of those little fireplace moments. Persuasion and sales is the same thing. That's why everybody is afraid of salespeople. That's why everybody runs away the moment that poor girl in Zara comes up. May I help you? Go! <laughs> As if she were the devil. Well, the wolf of Zara is going to push a dozen hoodies down your throat. <laughs> That's why nobody trusts a state agent. Because you're afraid we'll make you do something you don't want to do. We will persuade and brainwash and manipulate you into buying that house that you never wanted. Persuasion is sales. What if we changed that? What if we changed that mindset? What if we redefined sales simply as communication between people who want to achieve something? One wants to give, another one wants to give. And we meet in the middle. And we discover what really makes us tick. What if I'm not the devil? I'm just the person that pulls the trigger. Ladies and gentlemen, let's embrace our emotions. Let's discover our desires. Let's get to know our triggers. And let's celebrate the fact that each and every one of us are beautifully irrational. I have one question for you. What do you desire?